Storks, Herons, and Pelican Tribe, Part 2, by W.P. Pycraft. The Bitterns. These are birds of a remarkable type of coloration, adapted to aid their skulking habits. The coloration partakes so completely of the nature of the undergrowth among which they dwell, that aided by certain peculiar habits described below, they succeed in harmonizing so perfectly with their surroundings as to render themselves invisible to their enemies. The best known species is the common bittern, though this epithet is no longer applicable, for at the present time it is but an occasional visitant to Britain. Once it was plentiful enough, as the frequent references both in prose and poetry bear witness. These references have been inspired mainly by its very peculiar note, made apparently only during the breeding season. This sound is variously described as booming, bellowing, and bumping, and many are the theories which have been invented to account for its origin. Thompson, in The Seasons, says that it's made whilst the beak is thrust into the mud, the bittern knows his time, with bill and gulp to shake the sounding marsh. Chaucer, that it is caused whilst it is immersed under water, and Dryden represents it as made by thrusting the bill into a reed. Mr. J. E. Harding is one of the few who have actually watched the bird during the production of the sound, and from him we gather that it is made by expelling the air from the throat whilst the head is held vertically upwards. The protective coloration and the peculiar habits associated therewith have only recently been recognized. These birds, when threatened, do not take flight, but immediately bring the body and the long neck and pointed head into one vertical line, and remain absolutely motionless so long as the cause of alarm persists. The peculiar coloration of the body harmonizes so perfectly with the surrounding undergrowth that, as just remarked, detection is well nigh impossible. Although the pattern and tone of the coloration vary in the various species of bittern, which occur all over the world, this principle of protection obtains in all. The drainage of the fins is answerable for the extinction of the bittern in England. We would draw special attention to the great length of the feathers on the neck, which, when the bird is excited, are extended on either side to form an enormous feather shield. This is admirably shown in the photograph below, which represents a bittern preparing to strike. It is a curious fact that when extended, the hind part of the neck is protected only by a thin coat of down. When the excitement has passed, the elongated feathers fall again and curling around the unprotected area could defer the appearance of having a perfectly normally clothed neck. A wounded bittern will strike at either man or dog and is extremely dangerous owing to the sharpness of its dagger-like bill. If a dog advances on one not entirely disabled, the bird immediately turns itself upon its back and fights with beak and claws after the fashion of a wounded hawk or owl. Owing to the way in which the neck can be tucked up by throwing it into a series of curves and then suddenly extended, great danger attends the approach of the unwary. The bittern is by no means particular in its choice of food, small mammals, birds, lizards, frogs, fishes, beetles being alike palatable. The writer remembers taking from the gullet and stomach of one of these birds no less than four water bowls, three of which had apparently been killed only just before it was shot, for the process of digestion had hardly begun. On migration, these birds appeared to travel in flocks of considerable size, since Captain Kelham reports having seen as many as 50 together high up in the air, when between Alexandria and Cairo. Curiously enough, they flew like a gaggle of geese in the form of a V, but every now and then he noticed they, for some reason or other, got into great confusion. At one time, the flesh of the bittern was much esteemed as food for the table, being likened in taste and color to the leveret, with some of the flavor of wild fowl. Sir Thomas Brown, who flourished during the middle of the 17th century, says that young bitterns were considered better eating than young herons. In the 14th century, it bred in considerable number in the fens of Cambridgeshire and was so highly esteemed as a bird for the table that the taking of its eggs was forbidden. At a court baron of the Bishop of Ely, according to Mr. J. E. Harding, held at Littleport in the 11th year of the reign of Edward II, several people were fined for taking the eggs of the bittern and carrying them out of the fen to the great destruction of the birds. 
Decreasing steadily in numbers, the bittern continued to breed in Britain till the middle of the 19th century, one of the last nests being taken in Norfolk in 1868. The members of the pelican tribe may be readily distinguished from other living birds by the fact that all their toes are united in a common fold of skin or web. In the ducks and other web-footed birds, only the front toes are so united. The pelican tribe embraces several apparently dissimilar forms, whose only claim to be grouped together, judged from a superficial point of view, lies in the fact that they possess the peculiar type of foot above mentioned. With the general appearance of the pelican itself, probably everyone is familiar, but we had better mention here that the other representatives of the group with which we have now to deal are the Comorans and Gannets, common on the British coasts, and the less known darters, frigate birds, and tropic birds. These, as we know from their anatomy, are all closely allied forms, and with the pelicans make up a somewhat isolated group whose nearest allies appear to be the members of the stork tribe. The pelican figures largely in ecclesiastical heraldry as the type of maternal tenderness. Tradition has it that the bird, in admonishing its young, occasionally did so with such violence as to slay them. Remorse immediately following, the distracted parent drew blood from its own breast, and therewith sprinkled the victims of its wrath, which thereupon became restored to life again. The exhaustion following on this loss of blood was so great that the young had perforce to leave the nest to procure food for themselves and the sinking parent. If any, through lack of filial affection, refused to aid in this good work, the mother, on recovering strength, drove them from her presence, but the faithful children she permitted to follow her wherever she went. One of the most remarkable features of the pelican is the pouch which hangs suspended from the other side of the beak. This is capable of great distension and is used when fishing as a sort of bag net of which the upper jaw serves as the lid. The young are fed by the female which pressing her well-filled pouch against her breast opens her mouth and allows them to take their fill therefrom. Pelicans display great sagacity when fishing, a flock often combining to form a horseshoe and driving the fish into a mass take their fill. This method, of course, is only possible when fishing in the estuaries of rivers or lakes, where the fish can be rounded up, so to speak. Clumsy as the pelican looks, it is yet capable of wonderful powers of flight. Indeed, it shares the honor with the vultures, storks, and adjutants as an expert in the peculiar form of flight known as soaring. A North American species of pelican is remarkable in that during the breeding season the beak is ornamented with a peculiar horny excrescence, which is shed as soon as that period is over. Pelicans are natives of the tropical and temperate regions of the Old and New Worlds, and live in flocks often numbering many thousands. The nest is placed on the ground, and therein are deposited two white eggs. The young are helpless for some time after hatching. In all, some six and thirty species of Comorans are known to science, of which two are commonly to be met with round the British coasts, one of which also travels inland to establish itself on such lakes and rivers as may afford its support. In various parts of the world, Comorans are taken when young and trained to catch fish, sometimes for sport, or as in China, to furnish a livelihood for their owners. At one time, the master of the Cormorants was one of the officers in the royal household of England, a post having been created in 1611 by James I. The method of hunting is as follows. After fastening a ring around the neck, the bird is cast off into the water, and diving immediately makes its way beneath the surface with incredible speed, and seizing one fish after another, rises in a short space of time with its mouth full and throat distended by the fish which it has been unable to swallow by reason of the restraining ring. With these captures, it dutifully returns to its keeper, who deftly removes the fish and either returns the bird to the water or, giving it a share of the spoil, restores it to its perch. Comorants nest either in trees or on the ground. They lay from four to six eggs, and the young feed themselves by thrusting their heads far down the parents' throats and helping themselves to the half-digested fish which they find there. 
The Camorant has a certain sinister appearance equaled by no other birds so that its introduction in Milton's Paradise Lost, Book 4, 194, seems particularly appropriate. Satan, it will be remembered, is likened to a Camorant. So clone this first grand thief into God's fold. Thence up he flew, and in the tree of life, the middle tree and highest there that grew, sat like a Camorant. The curious bottle green plumage, green eyes, long hooked beak, and head surmounted by a crest of a smaller sea-loving representative the two bird species were doubtless familiar enough to Milton before blindness overtook him. Some of our readers may have made the acquaintance of the Camorans' nearest ally, the darter, or snake neck, in the fish house at the zoological gardens of London. For the sake of those who have not, we may say that the darter may be described as a long-necked Camoran with somewhat lighter plumage. The head is small and flat, and armed with a pointed, dagger-like bill whose edges are finely toothed, with needle-like points projecting backwards. The neck is very long and slender, hence its name of snake neck. Furthermore, it is remarkable for a very strange kink formed by a peculiar arrangement of the neck bones, an arrangement intimately associated with its peculiar method of capturing its prey, which, as with the Camorin, is pursued underwater. How dexterously this is done may be seen any day in the fish house of the zoological gardens, where, as we have already mentioned, these birds are kept. At feeding time, they are turned loose into a large tank into which a number of small fish have been placed. The birds dive as soon as they reach the water and with surprising speed chase their prey till within short range. Then by a sudden bayonet-like lunge made possible by the peculiar kink in the neck, a victim is transfixed, brought to the surface, released from the bill by a series of sudden jerks, tossed into the air and dexterously caught and swallowed. The darter is found in Africa, India, the Malay region, Australia, and South America, frequenting the banks of rivers, lakes, and swamps, sometimes singly, sometimes in pairs or in immense flocks. Very different from either of the foregoing species, both in build and coloration, is the gannet. In its habits, it is also different. The adult bird is about the size of a goose, white in color and armed with a powerful pointed bill. The young have a quite distinct plumage, being deep brown, speckled with white, this livery being worn for nearly three years. The greater part of a gannet's lifetime seems to be spent upon the wing, a fact which implies a very different method of feeding from that followed by the camorra and darter, and this is actually the case. Preying upon shoals of herring, mackerel, sprats, or pilchards, the birds, flying singly or in flocks, as soon as the fish are discovered, rise, soar in circles to such a height as experience shows best calculated to carry them by a downward motion to the required depth, and then, partially closing the wings, plunge upon their prey, and rarely without success, the time which elapses between the plunge and the immersion being about 15 seconds. A flock of gannets feeding is a really wonderful sight and can be witnessed in many places around the British coasts for the gannet is one of the very common British birds. The pilchard fishermen off the Cornish coast learn when the shoals are at hand and the direction in which they are traveling by the actions of these birds. A very cruel experiment is sometimes practiced upon the gannet based upon its well-known method of fishing. A herring is tied to a beam and set adrift and the bird, not noticing the trap, plunges with its usual velocity upon a fish, with the result that it is killed instantly by the shock of the contact. Gannets breed in colonies of thousands on the islands off the east and west coasts of Scotland. They lay but a single egg in a nest composed of seaweed deposited in inaccessible crags of precipitous cliffs. The young are at first naked, later they become clothed with long white down. At one time, says Mr. Howard Saunders, young gannets were much esteemed as food, from 1500 to 2000 being taken into a season during the month of August. They are hooked up, killed, and flung into the sea, where a boat is waiting to pick up the bodies. They are plucked, cleaned, and half roasted, after which they are sold at from eight pence to a shilling each. The fat is boiled down into oil, and the feathers, after being well baked, are used for stuffing beds about a hundred birds producing a stone of feathers. 
Gannets present one or two structural peculiarities of sufficient interest to mention here. In most birds, it will be remembered, the nostrils open on each side of the beak, but in the gannet, no trace of true nostrils remains, and the same may also be said of the camorant and darter. In gannets, however, a slight indication of their sometime existence remains, though the nostril itself no longer serves as an air passage, and these birds are compelled to breathe through the mouth. Again, the tongue, like the nostrils, has also been reduced to a mere vestige. Stranger still is the fact that immediately under the skin there lies an extensive system of air cells of large size, which can be inflated or emptied at will. Many of these cells dip down between the muscles of the body so that the whole organism is pervaded with air cells, all of which are in connection with the lungs. The frigate and tropic birds, which now remain to be described, are probably much less familiar to our readers than the foregoing species. Frigate birds are remarkable in more ways than one. To begin with, their general appearance may be described as that of a small, long-winged, fork-tailed albatross mounted upon particularly diminutive legs, so short as to do little more than raise the body off the ground. Their flight is wonderfully graceful and capable of being sustained for considerable periods, for, like the gannets, they pass most of their time on the wing. They feed upon surface fish, which they capture from the surface of the water without alighting, or upon fish which they take from the gannets of the neighborhood. Frigate birds build their nests in trees, on low bushes, or on the ground, and sometimes upon ledges of precipitous cliffs. The nest is a loose structure composed of sticks, and its construction is accompanied by much pilfering from one another. Only a single egg is laid. About the beginning of January, the male acquires a very remarkable pouch of brilliant scarlet skin, which hangs beneath the beak. Frigate birds are found all over the world within the tropics. The tropic birds, or boatswain birds as they are sometimes called, are more like gulls or the heavier species of terns in general appearance, and in no way resemble superficially the forms for which they are associated, save in the fact that all the toes are enclosed in the same web. A study of their anatomy, however, leaves little doubt that these birds are really members of the pelican tribe. Either pure white, relieved with black, or of a beautiful apricot yellow with similar black markings with a powerful bill and long tapering tail, the tropic bird is one of the most beautiful of seabirds. There are altogether about six species of tropic birds distributed over the Pacific and Indian Oceans. They nest in hollows of cliffs or holes in trees and lay a single egg, which bears some resemblance to that of a kestrel. End of Section 8 by Dave Currier